<clears throat> Father had taken his young boy to school one morning and, and was going about his day as he did every day, and the child was going about his day as he did every day. And uh, while he was at work, an earthquake hit the area. And of course, the father had a, a concern about his child, and so he was listening, and news came back to him that the school that his child was at was destroyed. It was reduced to rubble. And so, of course, as a good father would, when the dust settled, he ran over as quickly as he could to the, where, to the place where the school was, and it was exactly as it had been described. The school was just a pile of rubble. Broken rocks and bricks lay piled up there, and of course, the father's heart went out for the son, whom he believed to be in that pile of rubble and that building that was once a school, but was now just a bunch of rocks and stones. Well, the father couldn't bear the fact that his child was there, and he wanted to do whatever he could to save him. In his heart, he had a hope that his child was still alive underneath that rubble. And so that good father, that faithful father, began to pull one brick off of another brick and one stone off of another stone. And people would come by as he worked. And he didn't work for just one or two hours. He worked all throughout the day and into the evening. And people would come by, and they would say, listen, just give up. Your son is probably no longer living. We've all lost our children in that building. Just give up. And he refused to give up. And he kept pulling one brick off and another stone off. And he kept digging all through that rubble. His hands were bloodied. His knees were bloodied. But he refused to give up until he found his son. Well, as the hours continued to roll by, people because they had compassion on him, and they felt sorry for this father who had lost his son. They would bring him food, and they would bring him drinks, and they would try to encourage him and comfort him, uh, but he just refused everything. The only thing that was on his mind is finding his son. Well, you can imagine the thrill of the father's heart when he pulled one brick away, and there was a hole, and he heard voices down there. And he heard the voice of his son, and he said, son, is that you? And he says, dad, is that you? And he says, it's me. And he says, dad, I, I knew, I knew that you would come. How did he know that he would come? Because his father was faithful. And that day, the father didn't just save the life of his son. He saved the life of many children who had been stuck in that prison house of rock and stone that day when that building fell during the earthquake. Many souls were saved because of the faithfulness of the Father. This morning, we have a message. It's called Called into Fellowship. And our scripture this morning tells us that God is faithful. God is what? Faithful. Just like this father that we've learned about in this story, God longs to be with us too. Did you know, did you know that? He's faithful, and he longs to be faithful to his promises and to his commitment to humanity. So it says here, God is faithful through whom you were called into the fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. God is faithful. God is what? Faithful. Amen. God is faithful. Let me turn to the scripture here myself as we get started this morning. God is faithful. And so the Bible tells us that God is faithful. And when we think about faithfulness, it means that he is faithful to the things that he has promised to us. He is trustworthy to keep all of his promises. And the Bible is full of God's promises to us. He is faithful to his covenant promises. And we know this because we know that he sent Jesus into the world a long time ago. Just a little history for us this morning. Before the foundation of the world... God came up with a plan to save people like you and like me. In fact, everyone who would believe the Bible says God wanted to save and was willing to save at the risk of his own life. And so Jesus came and he laid down his life for us. We see God's faithfulness in even creating a plan for all of you, all of us to be redeemed. Uh, there's good news in the Bible this morning. And that good news is that one day we're going to go home to be with our father, just like this son was able to go home and be with his father. What do you say to that? It's something that we all look forward to. And the Bible tells us that God is faithful. Paul says that he who has begun a good work will complete it until the day that Jesus comes again. God is faithful. He will accomplish all that he's promised to everyone who's willing to be in a relationship with him. And so we have this idea, this covenant language that God is faithful. And it means that he's worthy of our belief. He's worthy of our trust. He's worthy of our devotion. And I wonder how many of this morning give him all of that each day of every week. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? We may believe in him, but do you believe him? Do you believe what he says? Do you believe that he is faithful? Do you trust him? That's a big question. Do you trust him? Because if we trust him, 
We will follow every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That means every promise that he's given to us, everything that he asks us to do, our response should be, yes, Lord, because we, we trust you. And not only do we trust him, but we want to be devoted to him. The way that we live our lives, the things that we say and do, when we come into every morning and we lay down every night, we want to look back, look forward and look back on our day and and say that we've been faithful to the Lord. That our devotion, the way that we've done everything throughout the day has been to the honor and glory of God. Why would we do it? Because God is faithful. Not only did he come up with a plan from eternity, but the Bible tells us that that plan was actually executed because Jesus came into the world. And we know the verse very well that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So we know that God is faithful to his covenant promise to save us because he sent his son into the world to save us. And so we find this beautiful picture of God's faithfulness In the gospel, God is a faithful God. He's a loving God. And as I look in my Bible, God has always wanted to be faithful to his people. Did you know that? He always wanted to be faithful. And we can look all the way back to the Garden of Eden, and we can see that he he wanted to be with human beings. He created Adam and Eve. He created them to be in fellowship with him, like we see here. We were all called into the fellowship of his son. But he, he created them because he wanted to be in fellowship with them. He loved them, and so he made them a garden. He made them a world, and he said, Adam and Eve, this is yours simply because I love you, and I want you to love me too. And so God created the world that Adam and Eve and their family would inhabit for how long, by the way? For how long? All of eternity, God wanted you to live in a perfect world. Does that sound good to you, by the way? Or would you rather stay in this world? So you want God to be faithful to his promise to create a new heavens and a new earth? Is that what I'm hearing for you, from you? Okay, good. So we're, we're thankful that God is going to be faithful to that. But all the way back in the Garden of Eden, we can see that God is faithful because he created Adam and Eve. And he's faithful because we know that even when they stumbled and fell into sin, what did he do? He made a promise to them that one day he would send a redeemer and he would redeem them from their sins and he would give them eternal life. And that promise was passed on to all of Adam and Eve's generations, all the way down to you and me currently, and everyone who lives beyond us, God's promise is to everyone who would ever live upon the earth. He's faithful. And so we see him in the Garden of Eden. We see him telling them about the promise of redemption, that even though you've sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, I still have a place for you in my kingdom. It's going to take a little while to get back, but I promise you that my plan will work. Why? Because God is faithful. So we find in the Bible that he comes to his people, and he says, let them build me a sanctuary. Why did he want them to build him a sanctuary? So he could dwell among them. Why? Because he wanted to be with them. And why did he want to be with them? Because he wanted to be faithful to his promise to make them or to bring them back into the heavenly kingdom, to to have them be a part of the family of God once again. And so he said, let them build me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Well, they did that and God dwelt among his people. And that wasn't enough for God, it seems, because we find that not only did he dwell in that temple made by human hands, but Jesus came and he dwelt in the temple of human flesh and he became one of us. And so God came closer to us. Jesus came to live as a human being and be a part of the human family and live and die as a human without sin so that we could be redeemed. God's faithful. What he promises, he will do. But that wasn't enough for the Lord. Jesus, we know, went back to where? Can anybody tell me? He went back to heaven to intercede for us and to continue the work of of the gospel and to make sure that a home was prepared for us, that our salvation was complete, and that everything that we needed in order to get back home would be provided to us because of of what he had done and what he is doing. But that wasn't enough. God says, I don't want them to be alone. I want them to know that I'm going to be with them even until the end of the age. Why? Because God is faithful. So God is faithful, and he sent the Holy Spirit to dwell, not just with us, but those who believe the Holy Spirit will dwell where? He'll be in us, and he'll give us strength and power according to the promise that God has given to us and the work that he accomplished through and in Jesus. And one day, my friends, we will be with him again in eternity face to face. Do you know why? Because he's faithful. And so when we read these words, God is faithful, it's fraught with meaning. It means that he's going to do what he says he's going to do because he's promised that he will do it. That's a good and faithful God. And I'm hoping this morning that many of you, if not all of you, have experienced at some level the faithfulness of God. How many of you have experienced God's faithfulness in your own life? 
Yeah, and I, I'm going to ask you, and you can answer yourselves, but how has God been faithful to you? I'll tell you how he's been faithful to me. He's promised, he's made promises to me. He's, he's promised to keep me from falling. He's, he's promised to present me faultless before his throne at the end of time, and he's going to rejoice over me with singing, and I believe that with all of my heart. Because every day when I live in this world and I'm faced with challenges and sometimes I stumble and fall, I know that he's faithful to forgive me of my sins and cleanse me of my unrighteousness. And I know that it happens because my conscience is cleared whenever I confess my sins because I know that God is faithful to forgive me and to cleanse me. How about you? You see, God makes promises to us, but in order for us to experience those promises, we have to believe those promises. And we have to claim those promises. So when you come into a situation or you have a need and there is a, a Bible promise in there that you can claim, my friends, do not hesitate to claim a promise of God because God is faithful and he who has begun a good work will complete it. He's faithful to his promises. And the Bible says that God is faithful and he knows no other way. God knows our future is hopeless without his son as our Lord and Savior. And so he's called us into fellowship with his son. When Paul uses this word fellowship, it means much more than just getting together for a good time. And that's what a lot of us think about, right? We're going to fellowship together. We're going to get together and just enjoy ourselves. Nothing wrong with that simple idea, but for Paul, fellowship meant much more than just hanging out and having a good time. Paul's usage of the word carries the idea of participating and sharing in the life and work of Jesus. It's a covenant relationship, this word fellowship. It means partnership with Jesus. I want you to open up your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3 this morning with me. I just want to show you a picture of how Paul uses this word fellowship outside of our current text. Philippians chapter 3 and I'll give you the verse here in just a moment. Philippians chapter 3, and we are going to look in verse 10. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10. When you get there, just say amen. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10, it says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. And listen closely, and the fellowship of his what? That means we share in the sufferings of Christ. We come close to Christ intimately, and we understand what it means to live as Christ lived. We share in the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death. And so, in other words, to have fellowship with Christ means that we share in his life experience, and we are conformed, or we're made to be like him through the process. Fellowship changes and safeguards us in the Christian experience. It goes on to say, by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Paul had a hope. And the hope is that one day this fellowship with Jesus would lead to his resurrection from the grave and eternal life with God and Jesus. That's what Paul looked forward to. Fellowship meant so much more to Paul. It meant identifying with the life of Christ. This is what fellowship means for Paul. And so the gospel restores fellowship not only with God, but among believers as well. So we often talk about fellowship, and our verse says that we have fellowship with Jesus Christ, our Lord, uh, God's Son. And we know that means identifying with his life and his work, but it doesn't mean just identifying with the Lord. It also means that we identify or we fellowship or we share in the experience in God's church. How does the Bible describe the church in the context of Jesus? What is it? It is body, and he's the head of the church, right? So we have fellowship with the Son, but naturally the outcome of having fellowship with the Son is having fellowship with each other. Do you get me? Are you understanding? You're quiet. Is that a yes or a no? All right. Have I been gone that long? All right, so fellowship means not only fellowship with the Son, but it naturally leads to fellowship with each other. And again, it's identifying with Jesus Christ together as we worship him, as we serve him, as we live a life to him. We're sharing in this life experience with Christ together. Fellowship with the Son naturally leads to this fellowship among the saints. If you'll go back to uh, 1 Corinthians with me this morning, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. The very first verse, second verse, forgive me. It says, To the church of God which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be saints, it says, 
with all who in every place call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, both theirs and ours. So when we think about being a saint, when we think about this idea, it means that we are more than just called Christians. We are actually living the Christian experience. Saints are those who call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. They are those who have given themselves totally and fully to the service of their Lord. So fellowship with the Son naturally leads to fellowship among the saints. And I just want to share this with you. This is not an original thought. It's one that I came across this week, but I thought it would be good to share this morning. It says, The hearts of the Lord and his followers were knit together by a deep sense of love and commitment. That sounds beautiful, doesn't it? You see, oftentimes we know that we want this deep love and commitment shared between us and the Lord, but sometimes that deep love and commitment doesn't go far beyond the borders of our relationship with Jesus. I would encourage you this morning, challenge you this morning, to know that this love and commitment, this intimate relationship goes far beyond you and Jesus. This deep sense of love and commitment should be shared not with just your Lord, but also with the rest of his body. Later, the disciples discovered that their own hearts were strongly united out of their common loyalty to Jesus. And you can read about that in the book of Acts, how closely they were knit together post-resurrection and after they had learned of the, of, the, of the things that happened, after they understood the things that happened, after the Spirit of God was poured out on the church, you find them coming together in this close-knit, united group of people, loyal and faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ. In 1 John chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, it We'll just turn there first. Turn to 1 John chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. First John chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. John, in writing about his experience with Jesus, their experience with Jesus, he says that that life was revealed to him. They had seen Jesus. They had witnessed the things he had said, the things that he had done. They had seen him. They had touched him. They had heard him. They had a real life experience with Jesus. And so he goes on to share in verse 3, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you. In other words, they've had this intimate fellowship with Jesus. And you can read all about it in the Gospels, how close they came to Jesus, the life that they shared with him over those years. And now John, looking back in those years, he says, listen, he says that which we experienced before, that fellowship that we have with Jesus, he says, we're telling you all about it now. And do you want to know why he was telling them about it? It says right here, he says that you also may have fellowship with who? Us. You see, fellowship amongst the church, this intimate love and commitment and service that we share with each other is a natural outcome of the gospel changing your life and changing my life. You see, when we come into fellowship with Jesus, it changes us. Would you agree with that? Yeah. When we hear the call of the gospel and we actually follow, it changes our life. You know when it doesn't change our life? When we hear it and we don't follow. And you'll find one story after another about those who did follow, those who did hear, and they did follow, and their lives were changed, and they were so happy about the changes that they experienced. In fact, the old life was now the old life, and now they have this whole new life that they were willing to lay down their life for. But then you have stories in the Bible of people who heard the gospel, but didn't receive the gospel, and it didn't change their life, and they walked away from the gospel and the church altogether, and we never hear any more about them. John was looking back on his experience of fellowship, and he was inviting others into that fellowship. And he says, we're telling you all about our fellowship with Jesus because we want you to have fellowship with us. And he goes on to say, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. He says the life that we live now is a life in service and faithfulness and commitment to God. And he says, but we don't live this life individually. We live it collectively together. And he says, I'm inviting anyone who's listening, I'm inviting you, as he writes this letter in 1 John, he says, I'm inviting you to, to participate in this fellowship, this relationship, this life together. I'm inviting you to be a part of it because if you come and live this life in the church, you're actually in fellowship, not with just other believers, but when you are in fellowship with the church, you're in fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ and the Father in heaven. That's what John says, right? That's what I'm reading right here. 
It says, we declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you. And you can almost hear the excitement coming out of John's heart, out of his, out of his pen. He says that you may have fellowship with us. He longed to bring them in into this covenant relationship with God. It was an experience. And he says, truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Fellowship with the Father and the Son should be experienced in a spirit-filled church. If the church is spirit-filled, there will be this type of fellowship that Paul is writing about, that John is sharing about. If the church is filled with the Spirit, we will have this experience that they're writing about. In this fellowship, this community, the greatest joy should be expected and experienced as we live and as we serve and as we share and as we grow together in Christ. Joy. That's what it should be. Every Sabbath that you come to church, you should find joy. You should find what? Joy. Now, by the looks on some of your faces, I'm not sure that that's there this morning. But I'm thinking it was just a long week, and there actually is some joy down in there. But I want to tell you that Sabbath should be the best day of your week. Amen? And that the days you remember all through your lifetime shouldn't be all the busy days and all the disappointments, but every Sabbath that you kept faithfully where you had the time to fellowship with Jesus and fellowship with the Heavenly Father and fellowship with the Spirit and fellowship with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Those should be the days that you remember. In our passage here in 1 John, it says about this fellowship, John, 1 John verse 4, uh, chapter 1, verse 4, it says, And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. Well, what was he writing about? He was writing about this covenant relationship that he had with God and with Jesus. And he says it so, means so much to us. It's changed our lives. This whole experience of being a Christian and walking with Jesus and living with Jesus and, being, and identifying with, with Jesus' sufferings and his life, he says this means so much to us. It's filled our hearts with joy, and we want you to be a part of it too because when you become a part of it, you become a part of a big family, and that big family is actually the family of God. In the book of Acts, they experienced this profound sense of community and togetherness where they did everything to do together. They did how much? Everything together. They had Bible studies together. They prayed together. They fellowshiped together. When I say fellowship, now I actually mean they, they just shared quality time together. But they also fellowshiped in the sense that they lived their lives in service to Jesus together. They shared meals together, etc. They had all things in common, the Bible says. And their purpose was to live for Jesus and to serve him together. That's what they lived for. So close was the community that it was called the household of God. So close was the community that it was called the household of faith. When I think of household... That's where everything that happens, happens that you don't want the rest of the world to know. I'm not talking about bad stuff. It's just like you're walking around in your pajamas. Your hair is not combed. Maybe you didn't shower that day. All those things that, that include just the everyday stuff in life. Like we come dressed to the nines for Sabbath. And praise the Lord. We want to give glory to God by the, the things that we do. So it's great that we come clean and dressed to church. But when we think of the household, it's where we share all the intimate time together. The ups and the downs and the everydays of life. Everything that a family is happens in the home. And so when we read that we're the household of faith, it means that we share our lives together. Not just what we want each other to see, but who we are. We identify with one another. That's what fellowshipping is. And so I don't want to see you in your pajamas by any means. But I, I do want you to know that, that God longs for something more than what we're giving to each other. Uh, we give each other the superficialities. If we become friends, we give a little bit more. But for some reason, we're so afraid to identify with each other. I, and I'm a part of that group. But what we read in the Bible is different than the experience that we're having collectively. And I, wouldn't, I would tell you this morning that Unless we're having this experience that's being described here this morning, this, this fellowship that we're talking about, this togetherness, this participation in the life and work of Jesus together, this covenant relationship, unless we're fellowshipping in this context, in this capacity, we may not be ready for the Lord to come. Because you hear John writing, he's saying, listen, we want you to come into fellowship, not with Jesus, but in fellowshipping with Jesus, you actually fellowship with the church. It's just the dynamic of Christianity. And so if we're rejecting one but saving the other, um, those two things don't work. If you have one, you have the other. 
If you're truly fellowshipping with the church, John says, well, you must be fellowshipping with, with Jesus because a true church is actually sharing a life with Jesus and with each other. Or if you're sharing a life with Christ and, and you're a believer and you've given your life, your life to him and you're in service to him, it will naturally lead you into this life with others who believe and live the same way. They both work together. And again, it was called the household of, God, household of God, the household of faith, and the life of God's family is to be governed by principles. Would you agree with that? Yeah. And so the life of God's family is governed by love. It's governed by tenderness, compassion, and humility. And yet when Paul was writing to the Corinthians here, he was troubled. And if you go back with me to 1 Corinthians... By the way, did Paul love the Corinthians? He did. He loved them uh, very much. Uh, you can hear it in the first eight verses or nine verses that he writes to them. He looks at them and he says, you're the church of God. You've been sanctified by Christ. You're saints who serve the living God. He says, you are the ones who receive grace and peace from God, your Father. You've received grace from God and it's enriched your lives. And, and he was telling them all about how the grace experience would, would change them all together and point them forward to the day when Jesus would, would return. Just follow along with me here in verse 4 and beyond. It says, Paul writing, I thank God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus. In other words, without Jesus, there would be no grace. Without any grace, there would be no salvation. We need the grace of God. But he's saying it was given to you through and by your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And that grace enriches everything by Jesus in all that you say, in all that you do. That grace brings you knowledge. It confirms to you that you're Christians and it allows you to come behind in no gift. And so Paul was painting this beautiful picture of what the grace of God does to the church. He's saying you come behind in nothing when you're in fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything that you need to be faithful to God and faithful to the church and faithful to your mission, you have by the grace of God. In verse 7 it says, So that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul saw them as a spirit-filled church, a church that loved the Lord, a church that had received the grace of God, a church that was looking forward to the return of Jesus. And in verse 8 it says, that God will confirm you to the end. And this is another way of saying that God is faithful, that you may be blameless in the day of your Lord Jesus Christ. Paul was saying, listen, God has got your back. He's got you taken care of. Just trust him. Believe that he's faithful to do what he says he can do and look forward to his return with joy and hope. But Paul says all this because he's reminding them of where they came from. He's reminding them of their mission and of their goal, the goal of returning back home to Jesus because he's about to share with them some things that are not as light as the first nine, <clears throat> the first nine verses. If you read with me in verse 10, Paul writes this. He says, now, after saying all these beautiful things, now I plead with you, brethren. I urge you, listen to me closely, he says, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, the name that you are saved by, the name through which you receive the grace and the strength and the knowledge and the wisdom and the power to be faithful to God. Through that name that you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. In verse 11, he gets to the heart of the matter. He says, For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. So Paul goes in this glowing uh, discussion about what it means to be a child of God and every benefit and privilege that comes, but he's saying that there are some of you who are not taking advantage of the privileges, who are falling out of fellowship and community. And are allowing things in the church to divide you and separate you from the household of faith. In 1 Corinthians 3, verses 2 and 3, if you want to turn over just a few chapters, Paul continues with this thought. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 2 and 3, he says, I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you weren't able to receive it, and even now you're still not able to receive it. Why? Because you haven't gained, haven't received the basic things of Christianity. Everybody knows, you all know this morning, that Jesus unites people, right? Those who believe. 
And so Paul is telling them, listen, you're believers. There shouldn't be division in this church. This is a basic teaching of Christianity. There shouldn't be any division in the church. You're called as a household of faith to come together in fellowship and give glory to God in everything that you say and everything that you do. You should be representatives of the heavenly kingdom. And he says, but in your life experience here in the Corinthian church, it isn't so. And I'd like to take you into deeper waters. I'd like to share with you the glories of God that have been revealed to me, but you have to get this right. You hear Paul's heart of love coming out of the Corinthians saying, I wish it weren't so. I wish it weren't so, but before it gets too far, Paul says, in, in, in love for you as, as a father, as a parent in the faith to you, I have to share with you that things aren't well here in the Corinthian church. In verse 3, he says, For you're still carnal, not spiritual. For where there is envy, where there is strife and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? That hit me in my heart this week as I read that. For some reason in the church, we think it's okay that God's grace will cover our willingness to be divided in the church. That God will be okay with us being envious or divisive or, or people who cause strife. We're, he's okay with the contentions and the divisions in the church. My friends, this morning, I want to let you know that he's not okay with it. When we live this kind of life, the Bible tells us that we're not spiritual, but we're carnal. And worldly people have no place in the heavenly kingdom. Our calling, Paul says, is to be bound up with Christ, fellowship, united with each other in a holy and common purpose, and yet you're living as though you were never called. That's how Paul views the situation. And by all means, Paul has some very good counsel for them. And I think that's why he refreshed them in the very beginning of, of this letter to them and just told them all the wonders and the beauty of what it means to be in a faithful covenant relationship with God. They needed to be reminded. And this morning, I want to remind you also that, don't, that you shouldn't be a part of any contentions. And if you have contentions with anyone in the church, make it right. If you have strife with anyone in the church, make it right. If there are any divisions among you, if there are any things in your current Christian experience that have separated you from Jesus, separated you from your brethren, make it right. Because not only does it impact your life, it impacts the life of the church. And believe it or not, your willingness to allow strife to continue, your willingness to allow division and contention to continue, you may not think that it impacts anybody but you, and you're in control of that situation, but whatever you're doing that's outside of the will of God impacts everybody in this church. And it's something that God wants us to be aware of because he wants us to reconcile these things because we are a part of the household of faith. And sometimes we may think it too difficult to, to deal with these things. We look past them and beyond them. And you know how it is when things happen in our lives. God brings conviction. Is that true? I need you to work on this. I want you to do this. I want you to turn this way. I want you, I want you to do whatever it is I'm asking you to do. And he makes us aware of the situation. But it, being faithful and loving, he never forces the situation. And what happens is that loud voice of loving conviction comes to our hearts, but then we refuse to listen. What happens to the voice? It dissipates, and after a while, we don't hear it anymore. And God can tell us right to our face at that point in time, this is what I want you to do, but we don't hear it anymore. Why? Because our consciences have been seared, the Bible says, with a hot iron. We're not able to receive the counsel of God anymore. And so this strife and contention becomes a normal part of our lives because the Bible says that we're no longer spiritual. We are carnal, sold under sin. Oftentimes we like to categorize sins and, and identify the sins of other people as worse than our sin, but I would say that there's a sin in the church that we have justified for a long time, and that's allowing division to take place when God says there's no place for it in the church. We should be the most united church in the world. Do you believe that? We should be. Oh, one more time. We should be the most united church in the world. Thank you. Why? Number one, because we're united in Christ. Fellowship with him leads to unity in the church. That's what we've, what we've been talking about this morning. But also we have a united mission together and engaging in the mission together gives us a sense of purpose. 
And we have an incredible mission, my friends, a mission like no other. I think that there are levels to mission, and we have the highest level of mission, but we also have the highest level of accountability, and that means to, to, to take the message with effectiveness to the world that cannot be what Paul is describing that was in the church in Corinth. We can't have this division and separation and contention. We have to be on the same page, just like they were on, on the days, on the days uh, post-Pentecost. I, I know that there were still struggles in the church, right, after Pentecost, were there? Yeah, did they have their challenges? Yeah, but they were, able, they were able to face them in faith. They had faithful counselors and, and apostles and prophets and, and Christians who were willing to look these things in the face and say, hey, listen, maybe we need to change the way we're doing things. Maybe my heart needs to be changed. Maybe I need to take these things to the Lord. Maybe as a church, we need to identify the problems that we have and hit them head on by the grace of God because God is faithful and he will not allow us to stumble and fall when it comes to our Christian experience. He wants to take us to higher and higher heights to experience more and more of him until the day that Jesus comes. God shares, us, shares with us these things, and in our mission, we engage closely together in this idea of fellowship to complete the mission. And when I look at the mission, we know the mission is to take the gospel to every nation and kindred and tongue of people. Would you believe that? Yeah. Now, that's been the mission in general for the entire church, right? All throughout the, the Christian age. We're to take the gospel to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. So you'll find people in other churches that are faithfully actually taking that gospel to the world. And it's a blessing to, to rub shoulders with other believers uh, around the world that may not be in your church. But I would suggest this morning that it doesn't just stop there. That gospel includes specifics that, that we have been given as a church that we are called to share on our mission to take the gospel to the world before Jesus comes. And we know that uh, we're to take the gospel to every nation and kindred tongue and people saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. We have been given special knowledge when it comes to those teachings, and we won't go into them all this morning, but if we were to move on, we also have the call to worship him who made heaven and the earth and the seas and all that in them is. You see, the end time church has the mission to preach the gospel and to call people out of the false teachings of Babylon and bring them into the true teachings of God's end time church so that they can be prepared for the return of Jesus. Paul is telling us here in Corinthians that we have to have this life of fellowship and unity in the Spirit so that we can be ready and look forward to the day when God reveals the Lord Jesus from the heavens. My friends, it'll be an incredible day. You know, that boy was happy when he saw his father. He said, I knew you would come. You can imagine the father had renewed energy after hours and hours and hours of digging for his son in that rubble and finding him. You have to imagine how his heart warmed and how his body revived as he reached down into that pit to pull out his son and all those other students and bring them back into the world to live. We should be looking forward with anticipation like that boy did when he anticipated the, the, the coming of his father. But we're united in a mission to take these special truths to the world, to describe to the world what Babylon is, what her teachings are, and to help them to understand the end time battle between truth and error, the call to worship God or worship the Creator. This is our mission, and it's to prepare people for the return of Jesus. We have a united message that we come together on. We have the most amazing message in all the world, a message that should bring ironclad unity to the church while attracting others to its beauty. I have never heard any other message like the message that the Seventh-day Adventist Church has. I've heard a lot. I can't say I've heard them all, but I've heard a lot of them. In those years in prison, I came in contact with so many different types of Christianity, so many different religions uh, that I was able to weigh everything against, against what I had learned from the Bible and what I had learned from the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I don't remember if I've told you this or not, but... Um, when I had called my mom and told her that I had gone through this experience with Jesus and that he was now my Lord and Savior, she was excited, and rightfully so. And uh, she says, well, I can't wait for you to come back and go to church with us. And my experience had led me to say, listen, um, if it leads me to your church, I said, then that's great. I said, but if in studying the Bible, it leads me away from the church into another church, then I hope that you understand that that's the church I want to be going to because I don't want to make another mistake. And so she said, okay, because I think she probably knew where it was going to lead me. 
Faithful studying led me into the Seventh day Adventist church, not because my parents were Seventh day Adventists, not because three generations before me were Seventh day Adventists, but because God had taught me from His Word that that teaching that the Seventh day Adventist church had was and is true. And I'm afraid that so many of us have lost our way. We've been watered down with the teachings of this world and the cares of this life and the desires and the things of this world that we're losing hold on the unique identity that we have and the mission that we've been given and the message that we've been given as Seventh-day Adventist Christians. We're united in Christ. We're united on a mission to save the world. And we're united on a message that will change the world and prepare it for Jesus. And we're also to be united in our relationships as brothers and sisters in Christ. The Bible says they will know we are Christians by our what? Love. Scripture provides several guidelines for enhancing this communion, this fellowship amongst believers. And I will uh, humbly say that these this outline that I'm sharing with you is not all mine. The bullet points I found, but the, 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 the thoughts that I'll be sharing will be mine. But Scripture provides several guidelines for enhancing the communion of believers in the body. Number one, love one another with the same compassion that Christ displayed to his own. The law of, the fellowship, the law of fellowship should be the rule of love. In John 13, 34, we find this Bible principle. It says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. That you do what? Love one another. And listen closely, not just the superficial love. It says, love one another as I have loved you. Do you have that kind of love for your brothers and sisters? What kind of love did Jesus have for his disciples? It was a sacrificial love that led him to say, I love my own and I love them to the end. There's nothing I won't do for them concerning their salvation, even giving my own life to suffer, and to die. You see, to love one another with the same compassion that Christ displayed is one of the guidelines for enhancing communion among believers. It means that there's no bias, there's no, there's no um, superficiality to our love. Love sees through the error and the disappointment and the discouragement and everything that we experience in, in personal relationships, love sees through all that and it sees what the person can be and it says, I want to love that person in a way that encourages them to continue on in their Christianity or to become a Christian if they're not. But the way that we love each other now, it's not love. It's friendship at best. And worldly friendship, I might say. There's something different that Jesus is looking for in the church, and it's true love, the love of Christ for each other. Number two, cultivate that spirit of humility that seeks the other person's honor. In other words, if even you've been hurt by a church member, the Bible says that we should still honor them and love them redemptively. In Philippians 2, verses 3 through 5, Paul writes these words. He says, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. In other words, don't do things for your own satisfaction, for your own selfish need to be met. He says, But do it in lowliness of mind, and let each person esteem the other person better than himself. And this isn't talking about that person who is the... the the person that you look up into your life that can do no wrong, it's actually talking about people that you're struggling with in the church and in the world. Because listen closely. It says, let each of you look not only on his own interest, but also on the interest of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in who? Yeah, so Jesus didn't come and uh, lay down his life. He didn't esteem others better than himself who were actually good and great and perfect people. He loved people who were broken sinners. And so when he came into this world, he esteemed others better than himself. And you say, well, he esteemed me better than himself. He laid down his life for you, didn't he? He gave his life for you. So he must have held you in some regard. Not because of what you've done or what you can offer, but because of his love for you. He holds you in the highest regard. 
And he says, the love that I have for you while we were yet sinners, and we talked about this, Mario brought it up this morning uh, in Sabbath school about uh, being dead in trespasses and sins. And while we were yet sinners, Christ came to us and he died for us so that we could live again. And so we find this, this idea, this principle in Philippians that we should cultivate the spirit of humility that seeks to honor another person with their salvation and eternal existence in mind. So if someone has done you wrong, forgive them. If someone has caused you pain and hurt, love them and have mercy. Esteem them better than yourselves. Leave the door open with compassion for reconciliation and for fellowship to continue where it should. Cultivate the spirit of humility that seeks the other person's honor. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Jesus. Lighten fellow believers, number three. Lighten fellow believers low by bearing one another's burdens. We should do that, shouldn't we? In Galatians 6, verse 2, it says, Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. We should always be there for each other. That's what God asks us to do. And we should be able to identify with each other well enough. We should be in this intimate uh, fellowship where we're serving together, we're fellowshipping together. We should be close enough to know when another brother or sister is hurting. Yes or no? We should. And not only should we see it, but Paul says we should do something about it. And I know that in our world we have our own burdens, right? We, We carry burdens. Yes or no? Do you have burdens this morning? Yeah, I've spoken to some of you this week, and I I know that you carry burdens, and my heart goes out to you. But one of the things that we're called to do is to make this sacrifice. As we read in the previous verse, that we should esteem others better than ourselves. How do we do that? Well, we bear their burdens. When we don't want to, we do. When I said we don't want to, in our humanity, we don't want to, right? We shrink from duty in our humanity. And if we're not careful and if we're not walking in fellowship with Christ, shrinking from that duty, we'll leave that duty behind altogether and we'll say, well, the pastor can do it. That's what he gets paid for. Or the elders can do it because that's what they do. When it's actually your duty and privilege to esteem that person better than yourself, to bear that burden and make a sacrifice and serve them and and bring them into the presence of the Lord. Or come alongside them and let them know what it means to walk with Jesus. You see, we're to bear one another's burdens because this is the law of Christ. Not only should we do that to develop communion amongst ourselves, but we should also share material blessings with brothers and sisters in need. If somebody has a need in the church, we try to meet that need happily in the church. And number four, or number five, it says, tenderly correct a sinner while being helped by, excuse me, tenderly correct a sinner while helping to find solutions to the problems. In Galatians 6, 1, the Bible says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, leave him to himself and take care of yourself. Does it say that? No. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, you who are what? Ah, spiritual person. You're having fellowship with Christ and you're in fellowship with the church. You're a spiritual person. You're esteeming others better than yourselves. You love Jesus with all of your heart. You're a part of that intimate communion with him and with your other people fellow brothers and sisters. It says this type of person, spiritual, should come to that brother or sister who is struggling and restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. A spirit of what? I've had so many people come to me with their ideas of faith, what I should be doing, what they perceived I've done wrong, and have just laid me out. Brothers and sisters in Christ. People who are called spiritual. God says that if we have seen someone who's struggling, it's impacting our life, or you see that they're moving down the, the hill, they're, they're stumbling in their Christian experience, to speak to them in gentleness, and consider yourself lest you also be tempted. We're all struggling in this life. We all have temptations in this life. We all are are wanting to get to the next level into eternity, but we are fighting the good fight of faith. We encounter the enemy every single day. When you wake up, you encounter evil. When you walk through your day, you encounter evil. Before you go to bed, sometimes you may encounter an experience with evil. Every day we are burdened by the darkness of spiritual powers that are not a part of the heavenly kingdom. 
We're fighting spiritual battles, and we need to look at each other and understand that in the church, these battles are taking place. So if a brother or sister is having a difficult time, it is not your mission and goal to tear them the rest of the way down. It is your duty to look upon them with the greatest privilege and say, how can I esteem this brother or sister better than myself? How can I encourage them in their Christian experience? How can I lift them up? How can I care for them? How can I bear their burden? Maybe they need a spiritual blessing. Maybe they need a physical blessing. But I want to be a blessing in some capacity. Lord, how can I restore this one who is close to dying? How can I help them be revived? Comfort fellow believers in their times of suffering. Paul writes, if any one member suffers all the members suffer. Did you know that? So when you're suffering, even if you feel like nobody feels what you're going through, and we don't know the depth of everything that one person may be going through, your struggle that you have, we can't fully identify with because it's your struggle. But the church feels it. So when you come to church and your head is hanging low, the church feels it. What should the church do, by the way? If a brother or sister comes in the church with their head hanging low, what do you do? Encourage them, love them, take them aside and say, is there anything I can do for you? Can I pray with you? I love you. Wrap your arms around them and let them know that in the church, there are people that care. Oftentimes, people just walk by each other in the church. And I see people who are struggling. I see them. But I see others just going about their business on Sabbath morning and missing the the opportunity to love and to care for those who may be struggling. Paul says, listen, if one member suffers, all members suffer with it. And that means indirectly and directly. So if you're suffering indirectly, we suffer with you because we see it in, in, in humans. We can sense the pain and, and, and hurt of other people, right? You can look at someone and say they're, they're going through something. Paul says, we suffer indirectly, but we also suffer directly when we hear about it and we talk about it. We suffer along with each other because in the context of this community that God has called us into, we share it and we learn about each other and we have the compassion of Christ. We're, we're guided by his laws and principles and so we naturally have a heart of compassion and love and redemption for our brother or sister who's going through something. Let us remember that we all suffer when a member suffers. Or if a member is honored, all members rejoice with it. This is what the fellowship is all about. Whatever we're going through, we should all be going through it together. And finally, pray for one another in the spirit without ceasing. All that happens in the fellowship, all that happens in our Christian experience, all of it should be undergirded with prayer. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, it says that we should always be praying with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. So what Paul is telling us is that we should be praying for each other because you remember in the beginning of our study today, we realized that Paul identified the, the church at Corinth as saints. People of God, servants of the Most High. And Paul says these people who have identified with Christ are part of the community, they're part of the household of faith. All these people should be praying for each other. How many of you are praying for each other every day? Maybe there are some of you who don't even know the names of your other brothers and sisters here in this church. I recommend that you get to know each other. If anything that you take away from the sermon today, get to know each other on a personal level. And if, maybe you're thinking, I don't want to do that. You don't have a choice. Well, you do. Forgive me. You do have a choice, but I would, I would choose the fellowship of the saints. That's what I would choose. You know why? Because you don't want to be at the other end of the stick. We've already learned that there's no good thing outside of the fellowship of the saints. So pray for each other always and never give up. In conclusion, I, I came across this, this thought. <clears throat> it was anonymous, so I can't give you the name of the author, but it says, you cannot draw close to God if you are at distance from your brother. You cannot draw close to God if you are at distance from your brother. 
Listen, the church is the church. Broken and feeble as it is, we've heard, it is still the apple of God's eye. It's God's church because Jesus gave his life for it. And it's called by God, as we read today. It's called by God. And it must rediscover what it means to be in Christ, to be in fellowship, to be in service, to be in a covenant relationship with its God and with its family. It must rediscover what it means to be in a covenant community with Jesus, empowered by the Spirit, and doing the works of God. Sin has had its devastating effects on the church, my friends. And it's caused divisions that we haven't realized that are there. You see, we can look around the church and every Sabbath, we see the same people and it's fantastic. But what we see doesn't describe what's happening. And this morning, as we finish our time together, I want to encourage you to be like the father who went looking for his son who would do anything to bring his son back into this covenant father-son relationship with himself so that he could have the joy of living with his son. I encourage you to have that perspective when it comes to your own family here in this church. Do all that you can to come closer to each other. Do all that you can to, 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 uh, to strengthen your covenant relationship with each other because one day Jesus is going to come. And he's coming for those who had fellowship with him and fellowship with each other. They identified with each other in every area of life. They identified with each other as saints, as servants, as brothers and sisters in Christ. They identified and came close together, shared their lives together in the most intimate of ways. This was the church. And this will be the church at the end of time. Heavenly Father.